In the first scene, we behold a contemporary city, or at least what remains of it. The world is immersed in total chaos and destruction. Panic-stricken people are scrambling for shelter, while emergency alerts blaring instructions for survival echo through the streets. Everyone is frozen in anticipation of something terrible. The scene shifts to a massive bridge where all traffic has come to a halt, and numerous people have abandoned their vehicles in a desperate bid for safety. This turmoil was caused by an invasion of monsters from another realm who somehow managed to infiltrate the human world. It wasn't a dream, nor a video game, this was the harsh reality of their world. Those who didn't manage to escape or hide were simply devoured. The ones who found refuge could only hope they'd remain unnoticed, uncertain about their fate. The perspective then changes to a young man observing the unfolding chaos from the rooftop of a building. He looks like an ordinary student. At that moment, a little boy stumbles, and his small dog barks at a monster about to devour them. Suddenly, the seemingly ordinary student leaps from the height, landing on the monster and obliterating it with a single devastating blow. The mysterious student manages to save the boy, but another monster lunges at him from a different direction. The student, evidently possessing some form of superpower, repels the monster with energy pulsating from his hands, resembling blue flames. In a matter of moments, he deals with a horde of monsters, and just then, a gigantic monster appears. Our hero, with the same ease, defeats it, punching a hole through its body with a single strike. At this point, another long-haired man watches our hero from a rooftop. He removes his cloak, revealing a demonic form, seemingly possessing powers of his own. After a momentary eye contact between them, they both launch into an attack, and we clearly see a clash of energies. At this moment, our hero comes to the realization that he is the cause of all the turmoil, and the monsters have come for him. Following that scene, we are taken back to events occurring eight months ago. Our hero is an ordinary student, often the target of bullying in his class. At 19 years old, he lacks respect, and older guys ridicule him, casting him in a bad light on the internet. He's labeled an outcast at school, his real name being Han Nero. No one wants to sit with him in the student cafeteria, as it's considered shameful to be seen with an outcast. After lunch, Nero takes pills for his illness when suddenly other students hit him from behind, insulting him by calling him a drug addict. They continue to mock him, reminding him that not even his mother can protect him since he's an orphan without one. One of the students starts to beat Nero heavily, and at that moment, Nero wonders why he can't fight back. His body feels as though it's held back by something, not obeying him. His anger, which should be raging, feels like it's shackled by rusty chains. He wants to get genuinely angry and take revenge on them all. At that moment, a 19-year-old girl named Lee Luna steps in, stating that she can't get her water because of their childish quarrels. The bullies apologize to her and promptly make way. Most of the students are head over heels for her. The beaten Nero stands up and silently leaves, after which Luna notices his pills and is horrified by what has occurred. After some time, Nero goes to the rooftop of a building in front of the football field. He watches the other students, all of them seem so happy and carefree, a stark contrast to his own situation. Nero can't bear the torment due to his weakness any longer and is about to step off the rooftop when a message arrives from his grandmother asking him what he wants for dinner. Suddenly, Nero realizes that he's not ready to die yet, as it would cause pain to the person closest to him. We are then transported to Nero's childhood, when he was just a small and adorable kid. His grandmother was his only parent. She cared for him and always made sure he ate well. She was prepared to give her life for him, such was her immense love for him. At that moment, another student named John Young bursts onto the rooftop, urging Nero to step back from the edge, suspecting he was about to jump. Nero responds that he was just admiring the view. John Young is virtually the only student who talks to Nero, but only when no one else is around, for fear that if other students saw this, they would mock him too. After this, Nero turns around and leaves silently. After a while, Nero enters the classroom and slumps exhausted onto his desk, while Luna watches him. The other students are huddled together, looking at a photo from their recent trip, which has caught their interest. They find a strange object in the photo and upon zooming in, some of them decide that it was a ghost, sending chills down their spines. The scene changes and we are transported to the location where the student's photo was taken. A terrifying monster crawls out of the building's pipe, talking to itself, muttering, find the key, find the key. Meanwhile, Nero returns home and tries to hide his bruises. As his grandmother enters, he quickly turns off the lights and hides under the blanket so she won't see him in this state. However, she notices the bandage peeking out from under the blanket and immediately understands. She calls him to eat before bed, but Nero responds that he had eaten with friends. His grandmother suggests inviting them over next time, and she would cook something delicious. While doing the laundry, Nero's grandmother notices traces of boot marks on his clothes, confirming her suspicions. As night falls, the same monster that was searching for some key approaches Nero's home. At that moment, a garbage truck with a worker thinking about his last stop before he goes home passes by. The monster approaches him and says that it wants his skin. The next day, Nero wakes up and looks at himself in the mirror, his face severely swollen from the blows. He's afraid of what his grandmother will think. 
She calls him for breakfast, but Nero responds that he'll shower first, hiding his bruises with a towel. Just then, the doorbell rings, and a courier at the entrance says he has a delivery for them. Nero quickly opens the door and runs to the bathroom, which makes his grandmother suspicious as they hadn't ordered anything. The courier comes upstairs and enters the apartment. Nero's grandmother meets him at the door, and when he lifts his head, his face morphs into that of the terrible monster. The monster lunges at the grandmother, shouting, I found it. However, she dodges his attack and falls to the floor, tripping. The monster continues his attack, but she dodges again. At that moment, she reveals that he's not the first to come to her. Suddenly, she activates a strange power and releases a red energy, binding the monster. It seems Nero's grandmother is not as simple as she first appeared, and she had encountered such monsters before. She shouts at the monster to stop its search, but it breaks free from her trap, once again shouting about some key and that it will continue its search until it finds it. The monster manages to break free from the restraining web and continues to attack the grandmother. At this time, an unsuspecting Nero is showering and hears some noise coming from the living room. He turns off the water to make sure he's not hearing things. His grandmother once again ensnares the monster and tells it to be quiet. She doesn't want Nero to find out anything. The monster strikes the grandmother and pushes her away, and Nero decides to check what's happening in the room, cracking open the door and asking his grandmother if everything is okay. Due to the shampoo on his head, he can't open his eyes and see what's happening and his grandmother tells him she's turned up the TV volume because her hearing has been deteriorating recently. Reassured that everything is fine, Nero closes the door, and his grandmother destroys the monster. After Nero showers, the swelling from the blows on his face has somewhat subsided, but he still can't appear for breakfast looking like this. Meanwhile, his grandmother cleans up all traces of the fight, so Nero doesn't notice anything. They both ponder what to tell each other. The scene shifts to the school, where Nero and the other students are running during physical education class. While running, Nero remembers that his grandmother seemed very thoughtful in the morning, her expression sad. The next moment, Nero faints and falls to the ground. While he was unconscious, he dreamt of hordes of demons running somewhere, burning houses, and a man with a burgundy cloak. Some strange threads led to this man standing by a whirlpool. Regaining consciousness, Nero realizes he's in the nurse's office. His head hurts badly, and he remembers his dream. He sees it every time he faints and wonders what it means. At that moment, his grandmother calls him and says they need to move urgently, despite having recently settled in this place. She asks him to pack his things when he gets home. Nero doesn't understand why they have to run again, it all started back in his childhood. We see Nero's memories, when as a child, he enters a new class, and the teacher introduces him to the other children. Since childhood, Nero had been bullied by other students, and many discussed among themselves the fact that he had no mother and lived with his grandmother. Sitting in class, Nero learns that he's moving and leaving the school, even though he had just recently arrived. We return to the present, where Nero is leaving the hospital, packing his belongings into boxes for the move, and going to bed. As night falls, his grandmother enters his room, pondering how much longer she can protect him. The scene transitions to a landfill site, where new monsters are literally emerging from the garbage, and their numbers are significantly larger. An unsuspecting man drives by the dump, cheerfully humming a song playing on the radio, when suddenly there's a thud on the roof of his car. One of the monsters hangs on the car and stares at the man with hungry eyes. When the man notices it, he loses control and crashes into a barrier, after which a horde of monsters swarm his car. The next day, a local policeman feeds a kitten near Nero's house, when suddenly the kitten unexpectedly scratches him. At this moment, a truck parks near Nero's house, and the policeman moves on with his duties. Suddenly, all the dogs in the house start barking as if sensing danger. The policeman notices a courier exiting the truck and heading towards the cargo bay. The courier opens the back door of the truck, and the scene changes at this point. Meanwhile, Nero and his grandmother are having breakfast, baffled by the dog's behavior, which seems like madness with noise from early morning. Suddenly, the grandmother also starts to feel something, as if her intuition is telling her something. She urges Nero to get ready for school and leave the house quickly. The grandmother literally pushes Nero out of the apartment, who doesn't understand her sudden change. Nero calls the elevator, and at this moment, the doors open, revealing a crowd of couriers, which looks very odd. The moment the couriers pass Nero, he starts to feel strange and notices a peculiar smell. Nero watches them and tries to figure out where they are heading. Then he enters the elevator and descends to the ground floor. By this time, the horde of couriers has already reached his grandmother's apartment, who is ready to give them a warm welcome. Nero steps outside and notices the truck. He peeks inside and is surprised to find it empty, wondering why so many couriers were needed. Suddenly, the sound of breaking glass echoes through the air, and one of the couriers, who now looks like a monster, is thrown out of a window. Nero yells to the policeman that someone has fallen from the upper floor and urges him to call for help. Disturbed by the situation, Nero runs back to the elevator, which has stopped working. He fears something might have happened to his grandmother and dashes up the stairs back to the apartment. 
Meanwhile, his grandmother is battling the monsters, chopping them into small pieces. A demon appears before her, dressed in a classic suit, and addresses her as Sana. He tells her resistance is futile as the king's army will be here soon. Disregarding his words, the grandmother binds him with her threads and asks him to explain himself. The armies he speaks of won't be able to enter this world. The demon breaks free from her threads and pleads for her to open the gate for the armies, claiming he needs the key. The grandmother ties him up again, trying to understand which king he's referring to. At this moment, Nero arrives on the correct floor and runs towards the door. The demon demands the key from the grandmother, but she replies she has no key and the gate will remain sealed forever. Nero tries the door handle, but it won't budge because his grandmother has locked the entrance. Hearing the commotion inside, Nero realizes something is happening and continues to bang on the door. The grandmother severs the demon's arm, but he still manages to wound her. The demon doesn't understand what she's fighting for and continues to resist. She tells the demon she wants them to leave her and her family alone. The demon recalls that she has been looking after a boy. From their conversation, we learn that Nero's grandmother, named Sana, used to be the head of the guard, but something made her renounce her title. Could it have been a child? As soon as the demon mentions the boy, the grandmother's fury ignites, and the energy around her shifts. The demon realizes that the boy is indeed the matter at hand and threatens to report this to his king. In the next instant, the grandmother slams the demon's head into the door, demanding him to tell her everything he knows since she's going to kill him anyway. The policeman on the street goes to inspect the body of the man who fell from the upper floor, but finds nothing except blood stains. He assumes it's a prank played by local kids. Meanwhile, Nero keeps pounding on the door, unaware of a monster creeping up behind him. Inside the apartment, Sana has defeated all the demons. She realizes they must leave urgently before new monsters arrive. The monster takes Nero hostage and knocks on the door with a smug face. The grandmother pleads for Nero's release, willing to give the monster what it wants. The monster, aware of her cunning nature, demands the key first or he will kill Nero. At this moment, Sana unleashes her powers to deal with the monster. Nero is shocked by what he sees. Sana notices his gaze, her powers wane, and the monster seizes the opportunity to sever her arm. Nero manages to break free from the creature's grip but is slammed against the wall by the monster. The grandmother rushes to Nero, but the monster impales her in the process. Witnessing this, Nero rises and charges at the monster to strike him, but the monster impales Nero as well. The monster smirks, expressing his disappointment in the former head of the guard, as she let her enemy defeat her over a mere boy. Suddenly, the monster is taken aback by a terrifying energy enveloping him. When he turns around, he finds a wrathful sauna behind him. Activating her ability, she directs thousands of energy threads towards him, wrapping them around him, and then crushes him like a bug. Exhausted, Sana falls to her knees next to the bleeding body of Nero. She reminisces about the days when she fought against monsters. It is revealed then that Sana is not Nero's real grandmother, but was entrusted by Nero's real mother to look after her son. While unconscious, Nero hears voices calling him back to life. He recognizes the voice and remembers having heard it before. The scene shifts to Nero's childhood, where he's beating a boy who laughed at him for being an orphan living with his grandmother. The boy's mother intervenes, slapping Nero and chastising him for his bad manners. Little Nero cries, overcome with hurt and mixed emotions. Sana sits beside Nero's body and concludes that, for some reason, cracks have appeared in the world, allowing monsters to infiltrate their dimension. The room is flooded with an abundance of energy emanating from her. She says she now has to return the weapon to the young prince and send him into battle. Sana gathers all her remaining life force in her palm and transfers it to Nero. From now on, his life will change, but such is the will of fate. Something happens and the chain breaks. Nero's body levitates, enveloped in blue energy, while Sana starts to fade, turning into ash. She bids Nero goodbye, indicating the end of her time as the head of the guard. After a while, Nero opens his eyes and regains consciousness. His first thought is of his grandmother. The scene ends there, and the story jumps forward a month. An irate policeman complains about people constantly pestering him. His partner informs him that the young man has come again, it's Nero. The policeman approaches him, chiding Nero for visiting them so frequently that he practically lives there. He tells Nero that he's already taken his missing person report and there's no need to come every day. Nero responds by insisting that his grandmother is not missing and shows him a sketch of the culprit. The policeman dismisses him as the drawing seems absurd. Returning home, Nero struggles to discern whether the monsters were real or just a dream. The only certainty is his grandmother's disappearance and his newfound solitude. Nero meets with the school principal, who informs him that he's been absent for a month and needs to return to school, not just for his own sake but for his grandmother's as well. As Nero leaves the principal's office, he runs into Chan Yon, who's surprised to see Nero back at school. Rumors are circulating around school that something has happened to Nero's family, with some whispering that his grandmother has died. During a running exercise, the students notice something unusual. Nero runs more laps than anyone else that day, and his entire aura seems to have changed. They barely recognize the Nero they used to know. 
While running, Nero notices that running has become incredibly easy. His senses have heightened, enabling him to feel the stones under his feet and the breath of the people around him. He has a strange feeling of being watched. After gym class, Nero walks down the school corridor and stops. Someone approaches him from behind, and Nero is certain that this person is somehow connected to his grandmother. Perhaps this is the criminal. Nero turns around and finds that it was Lai Luna. Lai Luna asks Nero if he needs anything from her. Nero responds that he simply mistook her for someone else. As they walk down the corridor, they engage in a conversation where Luna notes that Nero has recently stopped taking his tablets, which he used to consume religiously after lunch. Nero replies that his condition has improved, and he no longer needs them. At that moment, Nero realizes that he had completely forgotten about these tablets. He hadn't taken them since his grandmother's disappearance. In the middle of their conversation, Nero abruptly halts, jumps out the first floor window, and claims he just remembered an urgent matter and needs to rush. Luna watches him leave, perplexed. Just then, a group of school bullies descends the staircase, one of them greeting Luna. He asks if she was waiting for him, to which Luna simply turns around and leaves, not wanting to engage. Luna still has Nero on her mind, finding his no longer needed medication peculiar, but she takes it as good news. Late in the evening, Nero strolls through the city streets, noticing that he feels different lately, his body is changing, and the changes are becoming more pronounced. Near a shop, he spots Lai Luna, who appears to be a salesperson there, and decides to greet her. Approaching the shop, Nero notices an old lady struggling to load boxes into her cart. He offers his assistance, the woman reminding him of his recently lost grandmother. The old lady asks Nero to fetch another cart since the boxes won't all fit into one, and he obliges. At that moment, two school bullies enter the shop and happily greet Luna, not expecting to see her there. They ask her to sell them cigarettes and promise to return every day, offering Luna a chance to make extra money. Luna stands her ground, asking for their IDs, stating she would never sell cigarettes to children in school uniforms. One of the bullies' demeanors shift, and his tone grows threatening. He warns Luna of a potential beating if she refuses to sell them cigarettes, but his comrade pulls him away, reminding him that their boss is infatuated with Luna and would punish them if anything happened to her. The bullies exit the store and notice the old lady outside. They extend a band note to her, asking her to buy them two packs of Marlboro cigarettes and keep the change. The old lady declines, telling them they are too young to ruin their lungs. The same white-haired bully begins yelling at her, insisting that she do as he wishes. At that moment, Nero, who had fetched another cart, sees the commotion and yells at them to stop. Nero notices the trampled boxes and begins to get angry, while the bully, taunting him, provokes a conflict. The bully grabs him and drags him around the corner of the house, pushing Nero against the wall without a word. The bully mentions he's in need of another punching bag and begins to kick Nero. At that moment, Nero feels a growing rage within him, as if something is breaking. After the bully delivers a kick to his face, the internal fissure finally shatters, releasing some sort of energy from within Nero. As the bully lifts his leg to strike Nero again, Nero grabs him, clutching the bully's leg with inhuman strength. Nero's eyes begin to glow blue, and a symbol appears on his face. The second bully, noticing this, rushes over, seemingly after Nero broke the white-haired bully's leg. The bully asks what's with Nero's face, why is it glowing, and at that moment, Nero turns around and starts to run. As Nero runs, he ponders what just happened. Nero arrives in his yard, trying to recall the day his grandmother disappeared. He's certain that a monster's hand pierced him that day, but when he woke up, there was not a single scratch on him. Since that day, everything changed, his body felt alien. The following day, Nero sits in class, overhearing students discuss how Pat Kin Hack, the white-haired bully, ended up in the hospital with serious injuries from a fight. At that moment, the second bully who was with Pac that day looks at Nero, wondering how a man who used to be dependent on pills could become so strong in such a short period. He approaches Nero and accuses him of causing his friend's injuries. Nero apologizes for the incident, but the bully isn't satisfied and continues to provoke conflict. Nero stands up, looking the bully straight in the eye. The bully questions whether Nero was always this tall, and what's happening with his eyes, they seem inhuman. After that, the bully realizes that the previous night was real. Fearing Nero's strength and confidence, the bully turns around and leaves. Chan Yon, who sat with Nero, wonders why the bully left without fighting. It might have been sheer luck, but Nero had certainly become a different person. That evening, Nero goes for a jog through the city streets. He notices that dogs are reacting strangely to him, as if they saw a ghost. Nero runs to a construction site and climbs to the top of one of the buildings. Nero approaches a steel beam and decides to test his strength by trying to lift it. He fails to lift it and turns away, thinking that everything that happened was coincidental and he does not possess some sort of superpower. However, when he tried to lift the beam, he crushed part of the metal as if it were paper. He approaches it again and makes a second attempt, this time successfully lifting the several-ton beam. The following day, Pack returns to school, his leg in a cast and relying on crutches for mobility. Students whisper that the rumors about the fight were true. 
Pak's friend asks him what happened that day, how he injured his leg. Seeing Nero sitting nearby, Pak is at a loss for words. He tells his friend to lower his voice, lest Nero overhears them. This time, Pak opts for silent study. The second bully is perplexed, as if the world had turned upside down. As Chan Yon and Nero are having lunch in the cafeteria, the school's main bully, Gu San Chun, who constantly tormented Nero, approaches and demands their chicken. They reluctantly surrender their meal. As San Chun and his friends start their lunch, he spots Lai Luna and immediately invites her to join them. Luna, however, ignores San Chun's overtures, choosing instead to sit next to Nero and share her chicken with him. The entire cafeteria notices this and begins to speculate about a possible romance. The idea of Luna giving Nero her chicken riles up San Chun, further reinforcing his suspicion that they must be dating. After lunch, San Chun corners Pak and questions him about the truth of Nero being the one who broke his leg. He cannot fathom how the school's biggest loser could have done this. Pak confirms his suspicion, describing Nero as odd and advises him to watch Nero closely, particularly his eyes which sometimes take on an inhuman appearance. Lai Luna intervenes in their conversation, scolding them for acting childish. She points out that they used to pick on Nero when he was weak, and now they fear him. San Chun denies being afraid and tries to impress Luna. Luna challenges him to prove his words and suggests he confront Nero. San Chun agrees and sends Nero a message, calling him out for a fight in the school's backyard after classes. At that moment, Nero receives a message from an unknown number telling him that he needs to deal with this situation once and for all, otherwise, he will be a target of bullying his whole life. After classes, Nero arrives at the backyard where San Chun is warming up for the impending fight. He tells Nero that he didn't expect him to show up. Other students gather around to watch the duel. San Chun starts taunting Nero, calling him a loser and asking for some entertainment. Nero realizes that there are things he has to put an end to himself and decides to do it here and now. The students discuss the disparity in strength between them. San Chun is taller and heavier, considered the strongest boy in school, while Nero tries to appear tough. Hearing these conversations, San Chun agrees and acknowledges their unequal strengths. He changes the duel's rules and offers Nero the first strike, especially considering how much Nero has been tormented, he must be furious. San Chun presents his face and says, hit me. In an instant, Nero's fist is near San Chun's face, which contorts from the force of the air flow emanating from the punch. Nero hits San Chun with such monstrous strength that San Chun's front teeth fly out, his body lifts into the air and is flung several meters away. Nero tells him to get up, but San Chun is already too weak to do so. Then Nero approaches him, fist clenched. At that moment, San Chun pleads for him to stop and begins to cry out for help. Nero leans in closer and tells him he won't kill him. From the roof of a nearby building, Lai Luna has been watching all of this. She confirms her fears that Nero has drastically changed and it appears she knows his true identity. As night falls and Nero walks home, a strange creature trails behind and slips into his apartment. Approaching his apartment, Nero reflects on the fact that he is a new version of himself. He harbors no regrets, but he also doesn't feel relief. Not only has he changed, but everything around him has as well. 